And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Perform a wonder, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff, throw it down before Pharaoh, and it will become a snake. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they did also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. Each one threw down his staff, and they became a snake. And Aaron's staff swallowed up theirs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. This brings us to our uh, series of uh, messages that we're doing, uh, Snapshots from a Spiritual Journey. It's a spiritual journey of Moses. I probably, if I thought about this, would have called them selfies because he's writing the story about himself and these little snapshots he's taking of his own life. And they're giving them, he's giving them to us. And today I call our snapshot out of the life of Moses just one more night with the frogs. One more night with the frogs, all right? Uh, because we come to this passage, uh, we just were set up from our scripture reading that uh, Moses is going to go to Pharaoh and God's already told him he's not going to let your people go. It's not going to be an easy task. And as it turns out, for the next five chapters, there are ten times this cycle that, that they go through. And the cycle is like this. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. But Pharaoh isn't going to let them go. And so Moses predicts a plague if he refuses. Let my people go. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. The next thing that happens is Pharaoh refuses. And guess what? It happens. The plague happens. And because it happens, Pharaoh calls him in, Moses and Aaron, and says, stop the plague. I'll let you go. Well, soon as he goes out and the plague ends, he prays the Lord, plague ends. Then immediately after that, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And he says, I won't let your people go. He kind of likes slave labor, you know. And so he says, no, I'm not going to let your people go. Then what happens is it goes all over again. Ten times this cycle is going to go on in the next five chapters here in the book of Exodus. So we have ten plagues. I can't take time in one message, cover all ten of these plagues and do them any justice. So we're going to focus eventually on just one. But the first plague is, Moses goes in before Pharaoh says, let my people go. He refuses. And so Moses is instructed, take his staff out, and uh, the same one that turned into a snake and swallowed up the other snakes and all that. He said, take that and touch the river Nile, and the river Nile and all the water in Egypt will turn into blood. So he goes out and he does that. And for seven days, you can't drink the water. So the only way they're surviving is they're going alongside the Nile, they're digging in the sand, wonderful filter, and they finally can find some good water to drink. And for, for all this time, they're able to, uh, they got this plague going on in the land of Egypt. Now just as it was with the, the, the staff when they threw it down and the, the magicians threw their arts, you know, they, the staff turned into a snake, so the magicians come in and they do some kind of trick to change the water to, to blood too. I know how this works. In uh, my, my, my second church, we had a ministry to uh, the handicapped, mentally impaired. And uh, they came to church for a class that we had and, and we were teaching how Jesus taught the water, changed the water to wine. And uh, so we had to good water and, you know, as clear as could be in the picture, you could see it was clear. And we had a cup that we put a little bit of Kool-Aid in the bottom. And so when we poured the water in, it turned into wine. It turned into Kool-Aid. And, and, and they thought that we really did the miracle, okay? And so these magicians, okay, somehow they're able on some kind of limited scale to trick at least Pharaoh that he had changed the water into blood, just as God did. And finally, God takes that, 
that plague away. The second one is about the frogs. And the frogs is what I really want to talk about, so we'll skip that for now. Uh, the third one is, he goes, to, goes says, let my people go. He refuses, and God says, he turned the sand of Egypt into gnats. Gnats everywhere, okay? And it's at this point, because the magicians can't reproduce the miracle, okay? They say, this is the finger of God. You better listen to Moses, all right? They're already getting it, all right? And, and so, uh, and, and Pharaoh, uh, he, he, you know, he says, I'll let your people go. Soon as it's relented, you know, the, the, the problem is gone. He hardened his hearts, and he won't let the people of, of God go. It's interesting with the next one, that this one, uh, he goes before him, and he won't let the people go, so there's flies everywhere. Now, flies are the most annoying thing. I still don't know why God created them. I think he created them to annoy Pharaoh. And he wanted us to know how he annoyed Pharaoh, so he left them around for us just to appreciate a passage like this. <laughs> but there's flies everywhere except in Goshen. Goshen is where God's people dwell. Up to this point, everybody was, was under what was happening. Blood was even everywhere. And so even the Israelites are seeing and knowing that the Lord is God. But at this point, he says, I want to I separate and distinguish between my people and those who are not my people. And so all the, all, all the plagues that follow, there's a distinction. They're only on the Egyptians and not on the Israelites. And so there's flies everywhere. He said, I'll let your people go. And as soon as uh, Moses prays and the, the flies are gone, he hardens his heart. The fifth one is uh, very pricey because uh, the fifth one, uh, God strikes all the animals, all the livestock. And uh, the livestock is all, all dead except for the Israelites. They still have all their camel, cattle. They have all their animals. The, the next one, Moses takes some soot, throws it in the air, and somehow that soot goes everywhere, everywhere but in Goshen. And when it lands and touches on people, they get these terrible boils. Not just the people, the animals too, except in Goshen. He cries out and he says, listen, I'll let your people go. Just pray that it'll be stopped. He prays, the plague ends, Pharaoh hardens his heart once more. The next one is hail. He says, listen, if you don't let my people go, God is going to strike the land with hail, and hail comes. I mean, this must have been some hail, because it says in the Bible, there had never been a hailstorm like that in Egypt from the beginning of time. I'll bet there were some pretty good size, because it kills everything that is not being protected. If it wasn't in storage, ruins the whole crops, everything. Anything that's out, out of doors, man, beast, crops is destroyed. The magician soothsayers and all the rest, they come to Pharaoh and says, say to him, you better listen to Moses because Egypt is ruined. Those are his words. Still, when Moses prays, the plague stops. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. And so there's a, another plague that's coming upon them. Whatever was destroyed, God sends an east wind and all these locusts up here. The locusts eat up and devour. I mean, they couldn't even go out and collect the crops that were destroyed. They eat up everything. Pharaoh pray, pleads with Moses to pray. Moses prays. It ends. He hardens his heart. The last, the, the, this is the next to the last one, the ninth one. Darkness comes upon the face of the land everywhere but Goshen. It says the, the darkness could be felt. You could feel the darkness. The darkness is so severe, no one leaves their home. Some people don't even get out of bed because you cannot see. It is really, really dark. This just is an eclipse. This is God supernaturally bringing darkness on the land 
Finally, at the end of this one, Pharaoh says, Moses, don't you ever come to my presence again. You see, don't solve the problem. Get rid of the messenger. And that's exactly what he does. He says, don't appear before me again. Well, the tenth plague is the death of every firstborn male child in the land, except in Goshen. There they told him to apply the blood on the door. And where the blood was applied, when the death angel passes through Egypt, he would pass over. And I don't want to get all the detail because that's next Sunday's sermon, okay? <laughs> this is my tickler come back, all right? Yeah. Out of all of these, the one that intrigues me is the one of the frogs. The plague of the frogs. It's the second one. And as, as I go to the text, it follows that cycle. Step one, Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. It, it goes like this. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go so that they may worship me. And so we got the first step of the, of the cycle here. The second step is this. If you refuse to let them go, see, he predicts the plague. I will plague your whole country with frogs. Now, the rivers will swarm with frogs. They shall come up into your palace, into your bedchamber, in your bed, in your house of your officials, of your people, and into your ovens, into your kneading bowls. And he goes on and on. Frogs everywhere. That's a lot of frogs. Step three is implied in the text. He refuses to let the people go because the next step is it happens. It happens. And the Lord said to Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers and canals and the pools and make frogs come out of the land of Egypt, come upon the land of Egypt. And so the next part of this is they do it. They go down to the water. He stretches out his rod over, with the hand and over the waters and the frogs come up and they cover the land of Egypt. I mean, there's frogs everywhere. But the magicians, by their own secret arts, where they were trying to do all these tricks and perform similar stunts upon the land, they were able somehow to do the same thing. You see, this was just the second plague. But the problem with the magicians is they couldn't get rid of them. They could conjure some up through their sleight of hand, but they couldn't get rid of them. And so the result was, he had to go to Moses and say, stop, I'll let you go. And Pharaoh called on Moses and said, pray to the Lord to take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go and sacrifice to the Lord. So Moses responds, and this is what really intrigues me about this one. Moses responds, he says, kindly tell me when I am to pray for you and for your officials and for your people that the frogs may be removed. What's the right answer here? If you've got frogs everywhere and somebody says, hey, when do you want them to go? When, what would you say? Now! <laughs> hey, do it now! He said, no, I just want one more night with the frogs. Do it tomorrow. Do it tomorrow. Hey, you got to think. Aren't you thinking? This guy is a real fool. How stupid can you get? I mean, he must really be dense. He's asking you when you want him gone, and you say, oh. He's thinking, I don't know. I went online and looked up frogs, okay? And I went on images. Oh, my goodness. There are so many different kinds of frogs. There are green frogs, that's what you immediately think of. There are blue frogs. There are red frogs. There's yellow frogs. There's frogs that got yellow bodies and blue legs. There, I mean, there are so many kinds of frogs. I, I got a feeling Pharaoh said, you know, I really like that yellow and blue frog. <laughs> Good bed companion. I'd like to have him sleep with me one more night before I let him go. You know, he wouldn't think of any of that. I am just so intrigued. Why does he say, one more night with the frogs. We're thinking, this guy, what is wrong with him? Aren't you? Aren't you thinking that? 
I want to just tell you, you and I do the same thing too. We don't have the same frogs, but we got our frogs. We have our frogs. You know, there's the, the hide-and-seek frog. I call it the hide-and-seek frog. I'm hiding from God, and, and uh, God, I'll serve you. J just one more day, I, I got, got something to accomplish. Um, when I retire, I'll have more time for you, Lord. <laughs> I play hide-and-seek with the kids, the grandkids. And the youngest ones now that come over... Uh, um, little Amelia, when she hides, okay, and as uh, soon as I count, one, two, I get to ten, ready or not, here I come, she jumps out of her hiding place, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for her, it's not uh, hide and seek, it's uh, more like uh, finding me is the all-important thing. It's not the hiding thing, it's finding me. I want to be found, okay, um, there are people, they get so convicted, but they want one more, one more day without making the commitment. People are convicted about uh, coming to Jesus as their Savior. But I just want one more day, one more week. I, I, I just want this before I, I give in. We're, we're, just, we're just like him, that's our frog. Some people, it's just, you know, simple disobedience in their life. Uh, I just, well, one of these days I'll get baptized. One of these days I'll join the church. Or one of these days, you know, I'll, I'll start giving. Okay? One of these days I'll get around doing that. We have our frogs. Most of us, we're, we're doing most of those good things. You know, I just want to hang on to my anger and bitterness just a little longer. When I uh, went through a divorce, I was really angry. I was a little angry at God that this whole thing came unraveled. Here, I counsel people on good marriages and mine fell apart. How, how, God, why did this happen? All that kind of thing. And I was a little angry. And I attended a divorce recovery program, and it was called degree, uh, uh, Divorce Care. And uh, there was a, a session on anger, and I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. And I always talked. I told you last week, I like talking. <laughs> I didn't say a word. So the leader came to me afterwards and said, Dennis, you didn't say a word. You always talk. I said, I relish my anger too much to let it go. You see, something's going on here. You, we hang on even to things we know we need to get rid of. You know how it goes. I know I need to start a diet. I'll do it tomorrow. And you know what happens tomorrow? I'll do it tomorrow. I just want to hang on to this junk in my life. We all do it. We're, we're all just like Pharaoh. We want to spend one more night with our frogs. And sometimes it takes a guy like Pharaoh to expose in our own lives that I'm hanging on to junk I shouldn't be hanging on to. I, I'm hanging on to covetousness. I covet what somebody else has or jealousy. Uh, I, I'm hanging on to, and you just fill in the blank. You know, you know what your frog is. I'm hanging on to that. <clears throat> well, in the case with Moses, he said, okay, Pharaoh, as you say, so be it. So be it. And I noticed later as I was reading through the, the, the plagues, whenever he asks him to pray, he, he'll do that and he'll say, well, tomorrow... Tomorrow, God will answer your prayer. <laughs> you want one more night with this plague? You'll learn a lesson here, buddy. <laughs> you should be dealing with this immediately. He says, as you say, tomorrow, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall leave you and your house and your officials and your people, and they shall be left in the, only in the Nile. And I wish he had put in there, tomorrow. <laughs> because that's when it happened. That's when it happened. As I look in the passage, then Moses and Aaron went out and they cried out to the Lord. They prayed concerning the frogs that he had brought. And the Lord did as Moses requested. The frogs died in the houses and the courtyards and the fields. Oh my goodness, they were everywhere. I can just see Pharaoh going to the microwave oven. Oh, dead frogs. 
Going to make the bed? Oh, man. Get the vacuum cleaner in here. I got dead frogs everywhere. I mean, there's dead frogs everywhere. Listen, this is what the next part of the verse says. And they gathered them together in heaps, and the land stank. I like that. You know why life stinks sometimes? We got dead frogs. Too many frogs. Sometimes I have frogs in my life. And after they're gone, I realize and I look back, man, my life really stunk. Is that the way you feel about before becoming a Christian? My life really stunk. Now that I have Jesus, man, everything's so better. Isn't that what happens when, you know, here's a person says, you know, I just can't give, I just can't give, and, you know, I just don't think that's possible. And then, then you start to give, and you see how God blesses you. He opens the windows of heaven, and later you say, man, my life used to really stink, because you know the way it is now? God blesses me. God blesses me. It's just the way it works. They had these heaps, and the land stank. If we want our lives to quit stinking so much, we might just want to do a simple obedience check and say, God, what's in my life? Well, after the Lord uh, did that, Pharaoh saw that there was uh, respite, it relented, uh, things had subsided, they were gone, the stench finally went away. He hardened his heart. He hardened his heart and would not listen to him just as the Lord had said. Pharaoh spent one more night with the frogs. Pharaoh did it unnecessarily. He didn't have to have one more night of frogs. You know why he did that? That's the question. Why? Why, why did he unnecessarily hang on to the frogs? I call it because of procrastination. What are we procrastinating about? What are we procrastinating that we should be doing in our lives to get those frogs out of it? So we might have the blessing of God and not a stinking life. Procrastination is a terrible thing. In the Gospel of Luke, there was a man that was said he would, he, he said, I, I'm willing to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus said, follow me. But he said, uh, first, Lord, let me go and bury my father. Now, the indication of the text here is his dad is not dead. He said, well, you know, my, my, my dad's old and one of these days he's going to die and then I'll be able to to come and follow you. Or it's like, as uh, soon as I retire, well, then I'll have time to really do service to the Lord. Or, you know, we, we always, he's procrastinating. Jesus says to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Do it now. Another said to him, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those who are at home. She said, hey, don't even bother to go home and tell them. And the implication here is this must be some distance. Okay? Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is kind of like in uh, the terms Jesus is looking for in his disciples is... Uh, and in a game of poker, you know, when, when you're, you're to the final part and you just say, hey, you take everything you got and you say, Psh, I'm all in. I am all in. You put everything in. That's what Jesus is looking for, all in. All in. You know what we do? We delay. Because you know what? I want to keep a few of those chips for myself. You know, I'll put a bunch in, but I'm going to keep a little back, back for myself. I'm not all in. He's saying I want all in. He says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. He goes on and he says, <clears throat> nope, I skipped one. He says, come unto me, all you that labor, all you that are weary and carrying a heavy burden, and I will give you rest. I ask myself, what is there in my life? What's my frog that I'm hanging on to that I need to let go? Why don't I let it go? The more I thought about it, the more I thought about it, it comes down to pride. I want to be in charge of my life. Not give it up to him. He says, come unto me. He says, so because I'm hanging on to this junk, I'm not getting the rest. I'm not having the peace. And Moses and Jesus here are saying, you've got to give it up. You might as well do it now. 
my final thought is this. Don't delay whatever you got, whatever your burden, whatever it is, whatever your frog is, get rid of it. Come to him today. Come to him today. Just come to him today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, may we learn to be obedient without hesitation and procrastination and delay. But Lord, right now, in our hearts, we know what our frog is. And say, Lord, I'm letting it go. Now I'm going to be able to look back and say, man, my life stunk. I probably don't even notice the stench. I've been in it so long. Lord, I want the breath of fresh air. I want that holy wind of the Spirit of God to alter and change my life for your glory. That all the world will know that you are the Lord, Jehovah, your Yahweh. And Jesus is our Savior. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.